So, welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Maurice Dubay from Q4 Associates. Thank you for coming on board today, Maurice. Lovely to be here. How are you? You well? Yeah, very yeah. good, thanks. Friday afternoon for us here, so we're just winding down after quite a busy week for both of us. So, Maurice, would you like to just explain to us a little bit about what Q4 Associates does? Yep, okay. Um, so, Q4 Associates are a, uh, um, a digital workforce provider. So, we help organisations transform their organisation by putting in place a digital workforce. So, a digital workforce is basically a, um, a software solution such as AI or robotic process automation, uh, to mimic or take away the jobs that people have to do with inside organisations. So a lot of the repetitive uh, processing that big organisations have to do, for instance, the, the solutions basically really replace that. But, but what's critical is that that works in harmony with your people workforce as well, obviously. And it's kind of where we got our title from today, isn't it? Sort of doing what you love with people you love. And mm. I think we've talked a little bit about the fact that people often do these things that are boring and repetitive and they really don't enjoy. So you ultimately take that away um, and to allow them to get on with what yeah. they truly enjoy. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's actually one of the reasons that we're sort of in it. Is It's not just about helping organisations you know, sort of make money and, and save save costs, um, but it allows organisations to be far more agile going forwards, uh, but also better customer benefits, but better employment benefits as well, or employee benefits as far as, you know, not having to have big teams of people that are just coming to work to do the same monotonous job hour after hour after hour, you know, like yep. humans aren't designed to be robots doing the same sort of thing, so why are we making them do it? So, you know, it's a sort of personal goal of ours, I suppose, is to, to help overcome this current um, current way in which businesses operate today. Okay. Yeah. And so how long has it been going for? When did you start the business? Yeah, so we've been going for three years. Uh, we were involved in the sector for a few years prior to that as well. Yep. Um, so... Um, a couple of us sort of got together and said, well, wait a minute, we, we love this industry and we love what it can do. Uh, so we decided, yeah, join forces and, and get stuck in and, and do it. So, okay. Yeah. So three years. I mean, you know, a lot of businesses fail in the first couple of years of being there. Um, how did your first couple of years go? Uh, yeah, very good, actually. Um, it was really strange because obviously coming from a, a previous company, we had restraints to trade for a, a few uh -huh. of our customers, etc. Yep. Uh, but we, in our first couple of weeks, we got phoned up by the, the global company that we deal with who basically said, hey, we know you guys know what you can do and they're really good at it and we've got this, we've got this problem. Um, can you help come and solve this problem for one of our major customers? So, so all of a sudden, you know, day one, we almost had like six months worth of work for three of our guys, or, you know, myself and my other two business partners. Yeah. So what a great start for our business. That's it was fantastic. Really lucky. Yeah. So, and has it always been smooth sailing? Oh, it's, it's been, um, yeah, it's been an interesting ride. Like, uh, it's been busy. Yep. Uh, but um, I suppose that the challenge is it's been busy for us. But also from a customer perspective, they've had to learn a lot as well about, you know, what, what what works for them and what doesn't. So, you know, it's been very busy, but very sort of undulated, if that sort of makes sense. Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. So, so how many are there in your team now? Uh, so we're up to 25, which, wow. is, which is quite a milestone, actually. Especially we're, after three years. That's, yeah, that's well, significant growth. Yes, yeah. It's, it's pretty frightening growth, actually. <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why do you say that? <laughs> oh, just um, because you, you sort of wake up in the morning and think, wow. You know, what, yeah. what, what a responsibility you have, you know, sort of, mm. um, whereas I, I suppose, you know, we went into it trying to do what we love doing yep. and then all of a sudden you realise, well, wait a minute, we're doing what we love doing but we've also got this huge responsibility for a whole lot of other people's lives, etc. Yeah. So that, that's quite daunting as well. So, mm. yeah. So that happens a lot, changes. yeah, happens a lot in business because, you know, you go into something you absolutely love and before you know it, you've actually got this great big team that you are yes, you're responsible for. Mm. So what are some of the challenges that you've had along the way in terms of that growth? Yeah, um, obviously um, securing new customers is, yep. is, is a key one. I suppose every every company does that. But probably taking that a step further, it's about securing new customers that we we want to be working with. And I know that sounds quite arrogant, but, but one of my sort of key beliefs is, you know, you, you want to work with people you love working with, but that doesn't just include the people in your business. So, you know, we, we're also very fussy about whichever organisations we sort of partner with. Mm -hmm. But also... Um, uh, hopefully it doesn't come across as arrogant, but 
but being careful about which customers you pick as well, because you, you know you can pick a difficult customer and it can just drain the energy out of you, right? Which yeah. then isn't good for your other customers. So we are actually a little bit fussy about our, our customer base as well. So. Fair enough. Yeah. Mm. And so how do you pick the customer? Like, Because I, I hear you. Yeah, sure. I think everybody should be doing what they love with people they love. But how do you sort of know? Yeah, yeah you sort of weed it out in the whole sort of upfront assessment of the customer or, or you know, in the in the pitching. You know, yeah. if, if you're pitching for work and they're just difficult to deal with even at the pitching <laughs> stage, then yeah. it's easier to walk away at that stage, you know. Yeah. Yes, you can come across customers, I suppose, like from previous industries that you – you pitch or you get some work and then you get some difficult people in those organisations. But I suppose you've just got to deal with that as, as it goes. But, yep. you know, if my sort of advice, if you're getting hints where they're not going to be easy to deal with, then don't, don't go, don't go the there. Path, you know? yeah. yeah, let them down gently. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Mm. So in terms of, you know, when you grow a business, um, you're going from what originally the three of you up to sort of 25 staff. And I should imagine there must be some times when it gets a little bit stressful. Um, how do you personally help overcome that? Yes. Um, we, um, I, suppose, I suppose a key thing actually is, is we have – some really nice frank and honest conversations within our within our team like at the the ownership level yep um and we've sort of got past the stage that we don't take things too personally and and we know when the other guys are giving us feedback that they're doing it with the right intentions and i know yeah. it sounds very cliche and yes that's what leadership books say you should be doing etc but i suppose there's a very big difference between sort of saying hey we do this yep. and actually doing it um, mm -hmm. It's, it's quite funny because one of the, uh, the shareholders and I were having a conversation the other day and one of the first engagements we did was like we were travelling to Sydney every week for six months. So we decided we'd rent an apartment together. So it was funny because we were talking and sort of said, yeah, but we've been flatmates for six months, right? So you sort of yeah. think, well, <laughs> wait a minute, if you you know can survive as flatmates for six months, you can survive as co-shareholders or co-directors. You know, so, yep. so we do. We have some really nice conversations and we all know it comes from caring rather than sort of like a, an ego driven sort of basis um and yeah. i think that's really vital yeah patrick yeah. lencioni is one of my favorite authors and he talks a lot about the the dynamics of a team and making mm. sure you do have those open and honest conversations yeah. Yeah. yeah and i come across it in my work as well and it's you know it's really important because if you're harboring something and not letting it out um, it creates a whole lot more issues than, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the other key thing, though, too, is, and, and back to what I was going about earlier, is the the, the focusing on what you actually love doing. Yeah. You know, so um, as, as owners of a business, we went into the business because we wanted to be doing what we wanted to be doing on a day-by-day basis. So we want to get up every morning and, and know that we're going to be doing the stuff we love. Yep. So it, w it was quite interesting because we've sort of, as the original three sort of owners or, of Q4 Associates, um, we're doing the stuff we love, but then sort of realising, well, actually, we don't have, you know, the company's growing, yep. but we don't have somebody who's driving the overall business, right? Mm -hmm. And sort of thinking, yeah, but we're not doing that because that's not something we love doing. So, so we've just brought in a, a new CEO who's sort of, now a, sh a shareholder and, and has a, a wealth of knowledge in this sector as well. Um, that's Sam. Um, and it, it's fantastic because she's now slotted into, I suppose like a jigsaw puzzle, she's slotted into the piece that she loves doing, yep. um, which is doing a lot of the coordination and, as a CEO. Yeah. And now in the business, we're doing the jobs that we love doing. So, you know, and we have really good conversations about who should be doing what and validating, well, Actually, but is that what you want to be doing? Because yep. it's not just doing it because the business needs it. It's you've got to want to be doing those roles. So, yeah. Yeah. So do you have any tools that you actually use to help people uncover what they love doing? Because often it's hard to know, isn't it? Yeah. No. Good question. The And it's something I've sort of been quite passionate about for years. And in a, it's funny actually, in a previous job, I, yep. I sort of came up with a bit of a model, which was you, you want to be doing the the day-to-day -day activities you like. So it's not about a role. It's not about I want to be a, a project manager or a developer, but it's it's lower level than that is actually what are the, the actual things you want to be doing. 
Yep. And so understanding that, and I don't think a lot of people get to that stage. They sort of think, oh, I'd like to be a, a project manager because <laughs> yep. I can organize stuff. But but what is it underneath that? Is it solving problems? Is it tracking stuff closely? Is it um, being an innovator? You know, yeah. So what are the low-level things that you love doing? Um, so that's one aspect I sort of came up with is you, you've got to define what you love doing at a detailed level. The second one is, is what is your surroundings like? You know, is it autonomy? Is it that you need to be given direction? You know, what sort of people do you want to work with? Yep. Sort of really knowledgeable people or people who are friendly, like understanding your environment. environment yep. Yeah, and then the third one was sort of around the reward structure. So this isn't the dollars. This is what else is there? Is it... Uh, appreciation is it satisfaction yep. is it flexibility so sort of understanding those things and I, I came up with a model around actually just bullet pointing your answers to those things um, to help sort of flesh out you know what sort of job or you know employment you you really want yeah and then I, I heard another lecture and the guy said he had a situation where he went to a um, an organization doing some change management and they said go and talk to Mary on the production line. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we want her in the management team. So he went and spoke to Mary and Mary said, oh, but if I do that, I can't help the local sports club. So I can't fulfill my other personal needs in life. Right. So therefore my, my model turned into a four-piece model. So the last one is making sure that what you're doing is congruent with your other values and things that you want to achieve in life. So yep. so it's, actually it's quite funny because I sort of came up with this model and I gave it to, uh, hopefully not talking out of turn here, but I gave it to my team in a previous organisation to sort of say, hey, look, I'm... A lot of you are saying you don't really know what you want to be doing going forwards. And mm-hmm. and to help me lead you, I need you to understand what you want to be doing. So here's a tool. It's not to be shared. It's just to use yourself so you understand what you want to be doing. And about a week later, one of the ladies in the team came and said, oh, Morris, I, I need to catch up. And I thought, oh, dear. Oh, God. And, and she said, I'm leaving. I've decided to go somewhere else, and it's your fault. And I'm thinking... <laughs> What have I done now? What have I done? And then she said, you gave me that piece of paper to fill in. And she said, I've realised that, you know, this is a great organisation, but it's not going to fill a couple of my needs. And so it it helped her, you know, highlight what was really important to her. And she'd been there for 13 years or something, right? Yeah. And it just sort of highlighted, no, actually... She's got some needs that won't get filled in that organisation. So, so which is, you think, well, it's really bad for the business, but it's not, right? No. It's, it's great because it's better to have somebody, you know, even though she was very good, leave yep. than be there and not knowing really what she wanted to do, right? And so, not being yeah. happy and doing that. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah. That's interesting. I think the same applies to business owners too, right, though? I mean, we've got to really seriously think about where, where do we excel? Where do we put the, the best effort in and get the best results from it? Mm-hmm. And how do we make sure we love what we're doing every day? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And, and, I, and I also think it, it's getting past that ego, what I was saying before yeah. as well. Like it's really, you know, a lot of, I don't know, I've, I've spoken to a lot of startup people in my life and you know a lot seem to be you know i'm you know managing Manage director, director of, of one of, of morris dubay <laughs> associate and you think oh come on you know yeah and, and so it's, it's around that sort of stuff and yes that's great but yeah. i think people have to understand really what do they want to be getting out of bed yeah. in the morning for you know so yeah, yeah. No, i absolutely agree it's fantastic yeah. so your model is it available somewhere like yes, that? yeah, yeah we, we we put it on our uh, website so oh, yeah. if people go to q4 associates they can fantastic. they can look it up in the so that's q4 there. associates.biz right uh, yes yes or q4.co.nz yes. okay fantastic yeah. Yeah. yeah okay so they can actually find that on the website that's fantastic um i saw also we were just talking before you've got your um you're a blue prism certified partner um, and you are what's that? New Zealand's first and only double silver certified Blue Prism partner. So what does that really mean? Yes. Yeah, so, so Blue Prism is one of the tool sets that we use. So, um, and, and this is a, a configurable tool that you use to mimic what a human does. So instead of a human doing the same job, get logging into System A and updating some information and copying that to System B, for example, yep. um, you use a, a t- underlying tool set, and one of them is called Blue Prism. Uh, which is used that you configure to actually mimic what the human would do. And it's got the right security around it, the right logging, et cetera. Yep. So, so it's it's sort of real enterprise-grade solution. Uh, so anyway, so, so that's Blue Prism uh, and answering your question, what yep. does it mean? 
So obviously, uh, to be able to sell and install the software, you've got to be a certified organization um, and with different skill sets. So we are both certified as a capability partner and a delivery partner. So we're mm-hmm. double certified as a silver partner in those those spaces. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So I usually ask my guests when they first come on, I forgot with you, for a a professional and a personal best. So I'm going to go back a little bit now and just say, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what you, from your professional career, what's been your your best thing and what from a personal perspective as well? Yeah. And and it was interesting when we were pre-talking about this, sort of thinking about what what is the professional best. Yeah. And I suppose it comes to when... um, when we founded Q4, it was a sort of a moment in my life that I sort of thought, you know, where am I heading forwards? You know, it's mm-hmm. so easy to sort of evolve in your careers. And and every now and again, you're in the luxury space of thinking, yeah, well, actually, where, you know, where do I want to go? Yep. Uh, so part of that was was really reflecting on what do I want to do with my life? And, and, and it really came to sort of actually achieving something that matters. Like, you yeah. know, out of out of all the things that people are scared of, mine is probably on my deathbed and thinking, well, that was a waste, right? I, yeah. I don't want to I don't want to get there and, and think I've I've wasted this opportunity. So so when I reflected at where did I really feel like I'd made a difference, the the sad thing was it was over twenty years ago in the health sector and and it was sort of you know, major changes in the health sector in the sort of mid to late nineties. Uh, and don't know if many New Zealanders remember, but when they had regional health authorities, yes. etc. And and way back then, you know, there was major technology advances, etc. So we worked on some amazing things back then, as far as changing the, the health sector in in the way it collected data. So at that stage, it used to just pump money out to healthcare providers, obviously you know, looking after people, etc. Yep. But we changed it that not only were we pumping money out but had better visibility of where that money was going, but also got much better data back. So people could start, or analysts could start really understanding what was happening in the health sector, you know, like how much money was being spent on different genders or ethnicities or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, what were the most successful sort of treatments for particular sort of illnesses, et cetera. So it was, it was fantastic um, a fantastic achievement in quite a short period of time. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. So hence, yeah. yeah. And did that lead you into sort of what you're doing now a little bit in terms of looking at how you can make things better? Yes, d- definitely. Um, yeah. The whole, I mean, and back to, to Q4 and why I'm sort of in it is, it is about that. It yeah. is about something, ha- to me, something has to happen in the whole workforce domain. Like the whole yep. concept of work to me is, is, it sounds really bizarre and people think I'm a nutter, but, but it's wrong. Like, yeah. you, you know, how many, like I read something the other day that 80% of people are either not engaged or actively disengaged. So what? 80% of people don't enjoy getting up every morning and going to work. God, really? Yeah. You, you sort of think, well, wait a minute, is, you know, is that really right? Is it so, worth it? I mean, is well, it worth, life is too short, right? Well, well, that's, and that is exactly it. So it's, to me, something has to happen, you know. P- people, are, there's a revolutionary revolution about four-day working weeks, etc. Yeah. But still, if people don't know what they love doing, even four days is, is wrong. Still hell. Right? So, yeah. so, <laughs> so surely we should get to a stage of, of people out there actually, A, un- well, A, understanding what they really want to be doing yeah. and doing exactly that and I know it sounds a lot nicer than it is or easier than it is Mm -hmm. you know people are stuck with mortgages etc but people still should really understand what they like doing because then it has imagine if you get to a stage that people are doing what they love doing yep you know it's a flowing effect into their family life it's a flowing effect into society so it has a much much wider influence in, in life so you know, hey, we can make a difference. We can change the way organisations operate yep. just by being smarter with technology. But people so. are a bit scared, aren't they, about things like AI and, and you know, and the, the robots taking over. Mm. But the sort of stuff that you're talking about is things that really are just sort of mind-numbingly t- um, time-consuming and dull. Is that right? That, yeah. That's exactly it. And, yep. and it's interesting, actually, because you talk to a lot of organisations who are putting this in. And where they're focusing it is the pain points. It's where yeah. they can't keep people doing that job, you know. So, so rather than you know keep training new people to do this mind-numbing work, yeah, um, you know, let's focus technology in doing that, right? And and it, and it means that the organisation can pivot and change much much easier. 
Uh, but yeah, then it means these people go off and do something that's a little bit more exciting than just, you know, typing Number the same crunching. stuff yep. and, and getting RSI and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah interesting. Yeah. What about personally? What are you, um, what's your personal best? Yeah, personal best, obviously, besides that, you know, the, the family and, and that yep. sort of stuff, um, is um, we, I don't know, I, I, I pick really radical things to do in life. So, so as well as being in IT for years, Many years ago, I, I set up a forestry company. Oh, um, did you? Just, just um, I spoke to a guy um, that I studied with, and he said he was a forestry management guy, and he said, oh, great form of superannuation is forestry. So 25 years ago, we, we went off and created a forestry company just out of the blue. And then uh, about 10 years ago, my wife and I decided, let's plant a truffery. So we knew nothing about <laughs> truffles uh, or yep. owning a truffery, but knew it. We sort of lived in a okay area for it, so off we went and, and did that. So yeah, I I like doing the slightly bizarre stuff as well as the technology stuff. So the truffery, so it, you were saying before, it actually takes quite a while to get the ground right and everything else, but you can start actually producing truffles. Um, so where are you at now in that process? Yes, so yeah, it was about two years of uh, ground preparation, so that's yep. getting the pH right and and all the other chemical balances. Yeah, and lots of lots of work. So a lot of neighbours looking at us very funny. Like, uh, why have you got this blank paddock that's white with lime? And how many no, tons of lime was it again? Sixty six tonne of 66 lime. Sixty six tonne of lime on one paddock. One paddock. Yep. So um, yeah, we got some very strange comments and looks from the neighbours. Yeah. And then yeah, we plant a, a truckload of these tiny trees that are only about. 20 centimetres tall and just wait for years and years and years. So <laughs> so now we're, we're at the stage that, yeah, the dogs can go sniffing around and, yep. yeah, hopefully finding truffles. Oh, so, and that's awesome. That's yeah. fantastic. Mm. Hey, look, um, I want you to share a few things um, with our listeners around what they can do to sort of, you know, get back to doing what they love with people they love. We actually have a thing in EOS. We call it the EOS life and we say do what you love with people you love, making a significant difference. Um being compensated appropriately with time to pursue other passions. Mm. So, yeah, that's my my little um, EOS life mantra that I like to live by. What sort of tools can people use to make sure that they actually are doing what they love with people they love? We've got the tool that we talked about before. So yep, has yep. that got a name? Um, I called it um, – what did I call it at the time? It was a couple of years ago. Um, I think it was my work needs analysis. Okay. Yeah. So yep. it's just, just understanding – yeah, your your personal needs because everybody has different needs, right? And it's not something you go and share with other people. It's just something you use for yourself, etc. Yep. So yeah, my work needs analysis. Um, other tools, I really um, just believe in people talking to other people about things, right? Yeah. Like, like keeping it to yourself and sitting there, even you know, sitting on a hammock for half a day trying to work it out. But sometimes it just takes a bit of dialogue and and just bouncing ideas around and. The um, and don't lock yourself into sort of oh it's got to be in this domain you know I've, the amount of people I've dealt with over the years who've who've totally broken out of their current domain that they work in and actually just say wow I love doing this other stuff you know yep. yeah I, I was I was in one team and we uh, there was quite a bit of restructuring going on and one of the team members came you know left the organisation and came in about two months later and said. Um, I'm training dogs and it's been my passion for years and I don't know why I didn't go there earlier, right? Wow. And, yeah. And you just think, well, you know, that, that's fantastic that yeah. they've just gone off and, and have decided to do what they love doing. Right? Yeah. So, so it is possible. Oh, it is definitely possible. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And the third, yeah. third and last thing, what would you say? What advice would you give to somebody who's perhaps yeah. not doing what they love right now? Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, really take a step back. And, and back to... Don't think of a generic sort of thing that you'd like to be doing, like mm. a salesperson or whatever. Really think what are the the pieces that really trigger that that bit of spark and that excitement in your life. Yeah, um, and I think you can look to your outside um, interest and things as well to sort of think about that, can't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, so my husband's yeah. a musician and he, um, you know, he just loves music, um, but he's an actuary in his daytime job. So, but I think you can look at what you do in your outside life and go, oh yeah, those are the things that I really enjoy. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Well, look, thank you so much for coming on board today. Really appreciate it. Lovely to hear your story. And if anybody wants to get in contact with you, how would they do that? So it's just morris.dubay at q4.co.nz or yep. um, just on our website. There's a uh, an information sort of place there. That's yeah. fantastic. Thank My you pleasure. very much, Morris. Yeah. Thank you. Have a Great. lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.